All right, yeah. Hello, uh, welcome to probability lecture, advanced lecture number five for UCP. All right, so get right into it. Um, so probability. So yeah, a uh, random variable x uh, is said to take on values from some event space. So a uh, very common example is that you have a die and you take on values between one and six integers. Uh, and we say p that uh, x is contained by a as a subset of e is a probability that x is uh, going to be inside this uh, subset a. Uh, so let's look at an example. Um, so again, the discrete uniform distribution is a generalization of a die. Um, so we can label our uh, event space as numbers always, uh, one through n. Uh, and we said uh, that for a unique, for, for, sorry, for a uniform distribution, um, probably that x is equal to i is always the same value. It's always a one over n, right? So for a die, it would always be one over six, and so on and so forth. And now here's the continuous example. So continuous means that we're working with real numbers. We're working with the infinite uh, event space. So when we work on the continuous uniform distribution, we say x takes on values uh, from the closed interval a to b. Uh, and since it's uniform, basically um, for any uh, subset, we say that the probability that you fall into the subset will be proportional to the length of the subset. So we say that if prob the probability that x falls into some interval c through d, which is a subset of e through b, uh, is going to be the length of this subset divided by the length of the whole space. All right. Any questions so far? So right now I've kind of defined what is a random variable and what it means to look at the probability of the random variable falling inside some subset of our total event space. Uh, so probability mass function. So this is uh, going to apply to discrete random variables again. So discrete means that it's a finite event space. So the probability mass function completely describes uh, any discrete random variable. And it literally says, so this is our probability mass function. It literally says, given some element inside our event space, oh, I should be presenting this. <laughs> um, we say, uh, what is the probability that a random variable takes on this uh, value of little x? Uh, so for, again, for uniform random variable, if our event space is E, then the probability that you take on any little uh, x is just one divided by the total event space. A probability distribution function is the kind of like continuous version of the probability mass function, and this is much more important. Um, so the PDF, the abbreviation for probability distribution function of a continuous random variable, probably describes any uh, continuous random variable. And so what we talk about now is in terms of intervals. Right? And so one, one thing I should clarify, right? is that if I have a uniform random variable, um, the probability that uh, I take on any particular value, value so it's just like um, a, a 0.5, uh, the probability that I take on that value is zero. Uh, this is kind of what happens with continuous random variables. Uh, the probability that I take on any particular value will always be zero. Uh, so instead, what I have to do is I have to talk about intervals. So the way I talk about intervals is in terms of the probability distribution function. So this is my PDF. And when I say that uh, the probability that x falls in this integral a to b, I talk about it in terms of the integral from a to b of the PDF. All right. So uh, what is a PDF example? So let's look at, uh, again, the continuous uniform distribution. It's a very important distribution in general because of a lot, obviously. Um, so the PDF for this guy would be 1 divided by the length of the interval that I'm looking at. So for example, if I'm uniform from 0 to 1, the length would just be one, and my PDF would literally be one. And so how do I actually use this thing? So yeah, let's say that I'm interested in the probability that x falls between c and d, right? So of course, uh, for this to like make sense, I should probably have that c is greater than a and d is less than b, and c is uh, less than d, right? So then uh, by the formula, I set up my integral like this. So I'm integrating my PDF from c to d to figure out what is the probability that I'm lying between c and d. And then I'm plugging in my PDF here, 1 over b minus a. So I get that. And then because the integrals are linear, I pulled it out. And then I just have this simple looking integral. Uh, and then this is my answer. Right? So this is this is the same answer that we got before um, for looking at uh, probability of an interval being in an interval. Like this. Right? So for example, if like uh, a and B are 0, 1, and C and D is 0, 0 0.5, then the probability I land uh, between 0 and 0 0.5 is 1 half. So any, any questions on this so far? Any questions on this so far? Oh, OK. 
Okay, good. All right, so so let's ask a question about continuous probability. So uh, we have two people x and y, and we'll kind of represent these two people x and y as uh, random variables, and they are arriving uniformly at some place between time zero and time one. Right, so these are uniform random variables with the parameters a is equal to zero, b is equal to one. What is the probability that x arrives before y? So I'll try to think about this a little bit. And if you want to reload the presentation, I did the... Oh, sure. Any thoughts, any, any ideas how to solve this? Even if you know the answer already, it's like fine. You just want to explain it. I mean, isn't it just symmetric? Yeah, it's symmetric, right? Because there's no difference between uh, person X and person Y. Uh, so obviously, the answer should be it should be a one half probability that X becomes before Y. Um, but let's try to solve it using actually our uh, integral setups too. Um, and we should, of course, expect to get the answer of one half in the end. Uh, so let's break this down into a simpler question first. What is the probability that X comes before some time A in general, right? So uh, just using our definition before, uh, because uh, a is zero and b is one. We find that the probability that x comes for some time a is just one half. It's just a itself. So if a was one half, then the probability that x comes for one half is one half itself. Um, so then let's try to expand that. So what is the probability that x comes for y in general? So I kind of uh, hinting that I want to set up an integral. So I'll show you that. So uh, when you do this sort of thing, it's known as a joint distribution. So what you do is you have uh, your two random variables, and you have this wonderful paint on that drawing that I made. Um, and so we're looking at a joint distribution. So we look at the event space for x, which is 0 to 1, the event space for y, which is 0 to 1. And we see what is the region that we're interested in. So the region that I'm interested in in particular uh, is, uh, of course, this thing, right? Because I want that x comes before y. So x should be less than or equal to y, right? So then uh, what I'm interested in is basically this area of this region. So you can see here that I set up my integral that I want to integrate from y equals 0 to 1 on um, this thing, the probability that x is less than equal to little y, right, as y goes from 0 to 1. Uh, I could have also done this in reverse. I could have integrated from x to 0 to 1. It doesn't matter. Uh, and I find that my answer is 1 half when I do this integral. So in general, can I make this go away? I guess not. Is it your uh, picture I, backwards, like your shaded region? Is it? x is big. Why small? You're right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're right. Sorry. Should be should be this one, right? Um, yeah. I want I want x is small and then y is big. But uh, it doesn't matter, of course, because it's symmetric. So it's really the same thing. So yeah, uh, you can think of probably as being some area sh shape or volume in general. Uh, it might be a very complicated area or volume, and sometimes it's not helpful to think of it that way. But in this example is very helpful. Um, and whenever you're dealing with a uniform random variable, it's usually easier to set up like this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, any questions on how I just, like set up this integral or solved it or anything? I think my picture, all like uh, incorrect, uh, kind of explains like what's going on. This is the region of interest, and I want to know the size of it. Yeah. Okay. Expected value. So, expected value is like kind of what it sounds like. It's the average value that you expect to see when you sample a random variable. Oh, so what I mean by sampling is. So I have some random variable, it has its distribution or whatever. And so I kind of pick one randomly with, with the probabilities that are prescribed by this random variable. And I sample a single value. Um, so if I already sample a bunch of times, my question is, what do I sort of expect to see over time? Um, so for a discrete random variable, the formula is very simple. So the expected value of x, so we write this as e of x, um, you sum over all values x that it can take on, and you multiply it by the probability of getting that. Right. So every value is sort of weighted by the probability at which it appears. Right. So now going back to my uniform distribution again, the very handy distribution. Uh, so we have from 1 to n. We'll work with these as integers. Um, so yeah, e of x is equal to, so we are subbing from uh, 1 to n of over this little x. Uh, and the probability that it appears is, of course, 1 over n because it's uniform. They're equal. And so I can pull this 1 over n out of the sum. And then I have the sum of x from 1 to n. 
And of course, that is just this formula, n times uh, n plus 1 over 2. And then these n's will cancel, so I get n plus 1 over 2. But for a die, I see that uh, from 1 to 6, so 6 plus 1 is 7. 7 over 2 is my expected value. 3.5 is my expected value for a die roll. All right. All right, so now for a continuous random variable, I say e of x. So my LaTeX is going to have this weird border here because I pasted it in a picture. Um, it's now equal to an integral, right? So we're working with continuous things, but again, so a domain of real numbers, so we have to do an integration. So we do x uh, times the PDF at x, and we're integrating over this. So this is sort of the analog that um, instead of a sum, we're doing an integral, and it kind of looks quite similar. Here we have a PMF, and here we have a PDF, and an integral instead. Okay, uh, so now for the uniform distribution from 0 to 1, we say that e of x is equal to this formula. So now, remember, this integral should be over the event space. So my event space is precisely this. And so when I evaluate this, I find that uh, my integral gives me 1 half. And so my expected uh, value for this uniform distribution is 1 half, right? That makes sense. I expect to fall on average in the middle of this distribution if everything is equally weighted. Good. So one thing to note is that the expected value is a linear operator. So what I mean by this is that um, it's this formula precisely holds, right? So if I do a scalar multiplication by a random variable, I'm saying that I would like sample the random variable and then multiply by a. Uh, if I were to add these two things, I mean quite literally, I would add the results together. And what that means is that um, I can kind of uh, do these independently, no matter what. Um, and so I can do the expected value of x first by itself, and then uh, multiply by a, if you value y first, multiply by d, and add them together, and I should get exactly the same thing. Even though that this is kind of its own random variable by itself. I can split it for me. So, um, so for example, with two die, so this is a discrete example, so this x would be a normal die, and this y is an eight-sided die. Those exist, right? Octahedrons? Yeah. Um, so in D&D, &D, you might have heard something like 3d6 and 2d8. What it means is that three times you would roll a d6, uh, a dice with six sides, and take the sum. And then this time you take two times the, you, you roll twice a, a d8, a die with eight sides. Uh, so it would look like this, for example, e of, x, uh, e of 3x plus 2y. And then you can split it apart like this, and then you take their uh, expectations independently. Right. By those ex, okay. y, and ex, uh, ex, and ey from the previous slide where he talks about for the uniform discrete. Uh, I mean, from they're from right here. Yeah, but like the answer, like seven halves and nine halves. Oh yes, yes, yes. The, yeah, seven over two comes from. Okay, all right. So now let's do a problem. All right. Uh, so there are n kids, uh, and the ith kid wants uh, k i distinct presents, and you're told which of the presents that this kid wants. Um, and Santa's bot does the following. Uh, so it selects x uniformly from all n children. So this means that. Uh, with probability 1 over n, the ith child might be selected. Uh, and then uh, from that, based on that x, uh, you select y uniformly from all the presents that this child wants. So y is a present. And then you select uh, child z uniformly from all children, and you give present y to that child z. So you pick a kid, then you pick a present that that kid wants, and then you give that present to a random child. So now what is the probability that this uh, random child actually wanted that present. I'll give you a minute or two to think about that. So before even thinking of this as a CP problem with like a runtime or anything, uh, just try to think of this as a probability problem first. Try to figure out, well, how could I write the probability that uh, child Z wants this present?
Any thoughts or observations on this? I mean, here's a kind of hint is that uh, maybe we can think about uh, each present uh, independently. And then what is the probability uh, based on just looking at a single present? The probability that child T gets this present and uh, that is picked. All right, maybe I'll just get the is answer. It, is it like oh. K over N? Uh, for what, precisely? Um, like the chance that Z gets the present they want. Like, wait, so each one has K presents that they want? Every kid has like... like, uh, like is, is it they all want exactly K? No, no, so K, K I will arrange. Right? Oh, so it is, okay, never mind, yeah. it changes then. I mean, but you said something important there, right? Yeah, so it's like, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't really matter. Like, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. So, okay, so you were saying that, like, um, it, so if all the K were the same, which we actually we can change that, right? So let's say you, you fix some child Z, right? Um, so uh, if we knew the probabilities of each of the KZ things that he wants, if we know the probabilities of those things being chosen, uh, then uh, we know that if those are chosen, then there would be a one over n chance that it goes to child z, right? Yeah. So, that would, so that would be kind of if I'm looping through the children to try and figure out the answer. Uh, this is a little bit difficult. Um, there might be a better way of going to the presence and figuring out the answer. So I'll, I'll just give the answer for now, but yeah. So uh, basically the, the point is to look at each item and see uh, what is the probability I can get of one, uh, this item is chosen uh, after some child X is chosen and the probability that uh, it goes to some child who actually wants it. So Z actually wants item I, All right? So yeah, so that's exactly what we're doing. So it can be the probability of the item being chosen and probably going to a kid that wants it. So the point is that if the item is chosen and it goes to a kid that wants it, then we're good, right? So first loop over uh, the kids uh, and loop over, so loop over each kid X, loop over kid each uh, present Y that uh, X likes. And the probability of item Y being picked uh, is increased by uh, one over N times one over KX. So the reason is that uh, first uh, child X has to be picked and then uh, item Y has to be picked among, from among those things, right? So these are two events that have to both occur simultaneously, so we multiply them. Right? So, so uh, item Y being picked is incremented by this value. And then the second thing that we're computing here is the probability that it actually goes to someone who wants it. So for X, right, uh, X could again be chosen uh, to, uh, to go back to, um, or in general, any, any kid who wants an item Y, uh, like you would get an, an extra one over N chance of going back to that kid. Uh, so you would increment by one over N here. So if, so if item Y is like chosen by like uh, P children, right? Then in total will be incremented uh, P times and you would get P over N for the probability that someone wants Y. Uh, and then the answer, you just sum over each item and you take uh, this product, right? So you would get um, like for each item, uh, the probability of working out. And so you get the total probability of working out if you go over each item. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I think I was trying to solve it as like some kind of formula. 
I mean, it is a formula, right? Because in in the end, um, you yeah. you are taking a sum over this, but it's it's kind of uh, it's easiest if you filter by the items first. Um, oh yeah, should I do this slide? Dude? Uh, I can do this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so sometimes when you're doing um, probability questions or similar things, um, all your computations are kind of uh, working using fractions. So you could uh, technically print out the fraction, uh, but then they do this interesting thing where instead of printing out the actual fraction, you print out x times y inverse mod uh, a prime. So uh, this is kind of uh, interesting output format, but basically the way you do this is that um, what yeah so yeah so this this is meant to help you and not hurt you because you don't have to worry about full precision anymore. You can do everything precisely because you're working with fractions. Um, so the way this works is that whenever you're doing some computation, what you do is you you kind of keep your numerator and your denominator, and you just work with both numbers at the same time. Uh, wait, 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 no, no, lying. no that's I'm lying, I'm lying, I'm lying. I keep you probably this. Yeah. yeah. Wait. Um. So basically, the idea idea is that you want to have each probability uh, in the finite field, or basically mod m, or m is this whatever prime number that they give you, um, and you want to do your math with the probability like you do with doubles, except not really. Right, so you pretend that they're like doubles or floats, and you so if you're multiplying to probabilities or expected values or something, um, then you just multiply them and take mod m like you normally do. If you're adding them, same thing, you add the two probabilities or expected values or whatever and take the mod m. Um, division is this only slightly weird case. You can't divide the two numbers anymore because they're integers, right? So if you divide them, you'll get like some fractional value. So instead, what you do is you use this inverse function like I have, which takes let's you find a in a, a inverse uh, mod b. So you you call with if you want to calculate one over a, uh, you pass the inverse function a, and then for b you pass whatever your mod is going to be, and it'll calculate the multiplicative inverse of that, basically one over a, and then you can multiply that by your numerator of your division. So if you're dividing x over y, you do uh, x times inverse of y mod m using this function at the bottom, um, and that lets you do like your four basic operations. So. There's also an exponentiation operation, Palma. I didn't put this in the slide. Uh, but this easy, you can easily find templates online or uh, with from my good code for how how to do actual exponentiation uh, mod m. So like uh, a to the b uh, mod m fast. Um, this is a nice way to do that. Basically, the idea with this is you can always keep all your variables in the form um, x y inverse and do whatever addition multiplication you want like between those, and it'll still keep the right answer. So you can like always keep them in like the x y inverse form rather than like convert to that at the end. Um. So you, you actually can do what I was saying, or you keep a numerator denominator, which is like so much harder to do that. So yeah, I should do it to keep the new thing. Um. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now merge cards. Okay. So you're given uh, n cards, and they're like in a row, like an array, and there's a plus five thousand of them. And what you do is you have n minus one rounds, where you uniformly pick two adjacent cards, and you merge their values, like you only add them. And then this value is incremented to your score. Uh, so I merge these two, I get 3. I merge these two, I get 13. And then both the 3 and the 13 are added to my score, so I get a score of 16. So the question is, what is going to be my expected score at the end? Um, yeah. So that should be 19, right? I don't know what this is supposed to be. That's the answer for that test case, and it was twenty. Okay. Uh, the reason here's the reason why it's twenty. So you can do. Uh, oh, there's only two. This, yeah. You can do sixteen this way, or you can do like twenty-four the other way, I think, or something. Oh right, because it's average. It's not like yeah. there's one case. Okay. If you merge two and ten first, right, then you get twelve, I think. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, something like that. That's true. Yeah, Wait, what? No, it's, you get 11 and then you get 13. That's insane. Yeah, adjacent cards. Yeah, yeah. It gets 24. Yes. And 24 and 16 give you 20. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the picture on the right is just one example of a possible run that could happen. But there's other runs that could happen. You want the expected value across all of these options.
Um, could you take like a subset? Not a subset. What is it called? Like two one one ten or two one ten, and then calculate the sum of that and the probability of that. Those those like three four two being merged. Uh, are you saying you like take a subarray and like get the answer on that subarray? Yeah. Well, subarray like they're all they're all next to each other though. Yeah, yeah that, that's what subarray is. Yeah. Con contiguous, yeah. Um, I think you can do something like that, but I think uh, also that might. I don't know, Akif, what do you think? That might end up being n cubed, I think. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But I feel like if you drew the combination in a fast, like, like O1 thing. Yeah, maybe if you keep track of prefix sum, suffix sum, I think you might be able to get that in an answer. Oh, I'm not sure. Like, maybe. Start from like the beginning and then go all the way to the end and then do the second one and then go all the way to the end and then that, that would be n squared. Not sure. Uh... That sounds right. No, 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 but, but my point is, is that when you're trying to combine, let's say you look at some subarray 1 and 10, right? And you're trying to add 2 to it, right? Oh, you yes. can There's O, N ways you can add it to, you can add 2. You can, you can merge 2 with the first guy. You can merge 2 with the first and second guy, right? Sort of, like, it, right? There's, there's N ways you yeah. can add this 2 to the subarray from onwards. And since there's N squared such subarrays and you're adding, the transition is also N, so it's like N cubed. Was it clear what you said? I can explain it a little better. Maybe. Like if if you're if you're on some interval, right? You could you could have the first thing and the rest of it, or you could have the first two things and the rest of it. You have to go over each one, right? Because that that would that would, that would represent all the ways that you could uh, end up with this whole thing being merged on the next step. Mm. So your your combinations that would be a one. I guess I was kind of thinking, like, what if we can, um, like, the, I guess through the second row, it's almost like you're picking three random cards in a way. Like, you're, because you're picking, you, uh, like, I guess if you're independently thinking about the, the, like, the second row, it would have picked two cards, the first one, and then a separate one, the second one. So, like, okay. maybe you can take the expected value of picking two plus picking three all the way up to what n minus but, but which two right because uh for example yeah. like these two have to be next to each other uh these yeah. three also would oh have wait to be... they have to be adjacent oh okay I didn't yeah understand. okay So EM13 says, the two values get transferred down score-wise every time. So is it something dumb like two times sum over n minus one? Uh, it's not exactly that, um, but that's kind of along the right track where you want to think about uh, how many times maybe does this contribute to the sum in this one. So, so just to, just to show how that would apply here, right? So, uh, two contributes to the sum twice because it's merged once it's here. Take like a picture of that, Lily, on the next slide. Oh, insane! Very cool. But there's also the solution, so that's like not cool. Highly important. Okay, you can go back. <laughs> <laughs> two contributes to the sum once here and once here. One contributes to the sum once here and once here, and ten contributes to the sum once. 
Uh, and then in in the other in the other run that you could do where you combine these two first and then the two last, uh, it would just be kind of mirrored of this. Oh, so we could can we just think about it as like the uh, for the first row, each thing has a like two over three chance of being picked, and then for the second row, it has a like a three over three chance. So it's like the row plus one over n chance. Uh, pro probably or... easier to answer this. Akif. Wait, what? I don't understand. Wait, wait, answer like I'm not, I'm, I, I don't understand what you're saying exactly. Uh, I guess I'm it. trying to say that you can like take the expected number of times or the expected value for. I'm not trying to say it properly, wait, but wait, like, wait, 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 no, about it. So, so you're kind of on the right track, I think. But one thing to notice is that um, different items, depending on where they're positioned, get contribute different amount of times. So for example, yeah. Two, one is forced to contribute in this example twice, no matter what you, no matter what happens. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. But two and ten are not necessarily forced to contribute uh, twice. I mean, it might be considered once or, or twice, depending on what happens. Um, so you can't just do like a row by row case. It's, it also depends on like where the things or items are positioned. And like so probably, one, four, right? Probably if we just explain the next slide now. Wait, I'm explaining it. You're doing. Okay. Yeah, that was okay. what we saying before. Okay, yeah. So, so I think we got we pretty much covered most of the slide uh, based on what people were saying. Um, but the idea is, I we want to cover the contributions of each card, right? So, if you look at this, so I'm showing one in the example on the right. If you look at the red edges, that's one being used, right? Even though you don't see the card one in the second row, the fact that three is being combined means that one is also being combined indirectly. It's contributing to the score indirectly, right? Um, so if we count how many times each guy is used, for a given run, the score is just a sum across the card values times how many times they're used, right? So in this case, right, it would be 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1, but no, plus 2 times 2 plus 10 times 1, right, I think? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, I did it right, I did it right, yeah. So, so 10 plus 4 plus 2, right, that's 16, right? Um, so the neat part of this now is that we can use linearity of expectation if you remember that. So then the expected value of the score, we can break down the sum using linearity of expectation into the sum of the expected values. And then furthermore, we can take out the AIs because they're constant across each of the runs and to become sum of AI times the expected value of how many times each item is used. So th this sort of transforms the problem now. Instead of talking about score, all we care about is for some given item for some given card, how many times do we expect for it to be used? How many times do we expect it to contribute by the time all the sort of merges are done? The question still remains how to calculate um, this expected uh, used I, right? How, how, how many times do we expect some card to contribute? Um, but this maybe seems more tractable and depends on less, and this does not, de and one thing to keep in mind is that this does not depend on the sort of uh, values on the card, right? Used I is independent of AI. It only depends on where it is in the row initially. So, yeah. Are you just giving the answer? Yeah. Okay. Do you want know what people think? I. I, 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 I think give it. I can go over it. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was giving the answer. The answer is um, a DP. Um, and so there's a few ways you can write this DP. Um, but the way, uh, the way I'm we showing it is that you think about some card, right, um, in in some subset of, like, in some subarray. Right? Like, remember the subarray that David was talking about before, right? We have some card in some subarray. Um, and this subarray, the specific card we care about in this subarray, um, has some amount of other cards to the left and some amount of other cards to the right, right? Okay. Um, and we want to talk, and it turns out that this information is all we need to talk about how many times the card is expected to be used, right? Uh, if you want to think back to the earlier slide, this is some card I, some card that's in position I, right? It's a position five, let's say, out of total, I mean, um, 10 elements, right? There's 10 cards total, it's so a position five. How many times is it expected to be used? Well, we just think about how many cards to the left and how many cards to the right um, in, in that case. Um, and so if we think about this sort of DP state, um, it turns out that the transition is kind of relatively easy. 
Um, so the, the first thing to realize is that, uh, re remember, we were picking um, adjacent pairs uniformly, right? Uh, and it turns out there's only n minus 1 such adjacent, pa adjacent pairs, right? If you think about four cards, say A, B, C, D, you have A and B, B and C, and C and D, right? There's sort of three bars out of four cards, right? Um, and so n cards, n minus 1, like sort of adjacent pairs to pick, right? Okay, so that's the denominator for probabilities. Um, but for the numerators, there's four different ways to do the transitions. Um, so the first thing that could happen is that two cards on the left combine, right? Out of the x cards on the left, two of them are combined, and so x goes to x minus 1, right? You lost a card on the left. Um, and, and so there's x minus 1 ways to do that. For the exact same reason, there's n minus 1 ways to do the, the for the denominator, this sort of numerator is x minus 1 ways. Uh, symmetrically on the right, we could have y minus 1 ways for have two cards on the right combine. Um, and we just lose a card on the right, it goes to y minus 1, right? Um, and so for these two cases, we don't increase our answer, right? Um, the, the whole point is that our, the card in the middle, the card that we care about, is not being combined with any of these other cards on the left or the right. So it, our answer stays the same. Um, however, there's the other two cases, in which is that the card that we care about either gets combined with the card on the left or on the card on the right. And in those two cases, um, our answer does get increased by one because we've done a con contribution, right? Um, and so the probability and the number of ways each of them could happen is only one way, right? There's only one adjacent card to the left of the one you care about. And similarly, there's one card that's adjacent to the card you care about to the right. Um, and so when we do all this, uh, by the end, uh, the probability that, uh, I'll give the, the, not the probability, sorry, the expected number of times that we use some, some i, some card i, um, is just uh, dpi n minus 1 minus i. Because if you look at some card at position i, there's i cards to the left of it. And it's n minus 1 minus i cards to the right of it. You know, take position 5, right? Index 5, 0 indexed. There's 5 cards to the left, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And there's n minus 1 minus 5 cards to the right, because that's, there's n, n cards in total. So uh, n minus 1 for yourself, minus i for the cards to the left. Uh, does everyone see how these transitions sort of work? Or, or, or why these are the, 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 all the cases? Uh, actually, if you go to the next slide, this code, I think, which might make it easier to understand what's going on. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, so this is a DP thing. Um, so the first off, there's the base case, right? Uh, if there's no cards to the left, if you no cards to the right of you. Hold on, hold on. You want to explain this? Oh, yeah. yeah. So this, this is the DP macro that I, that I use to just uh, talk about, uh, just make it easier to reference DPXY, right? Because that's the answer, and I don't want to write out DPXY every time, so I just use that. That's all that is. Um, yeah, so uh, in, in, the, in the base case where you have no cards to the left and no cards to the right, uh, you're the only card left, you're never going to merge. There's no merge that ever happen. So your expected or your, your fixed answer is just going to be zero. No, no merge ever happen, right? Okay. Okay, now except for that case, other than that case, uh, we can calculate n, which is the total number of cards, which is just number of cards to the left, number of cards to the right, plus yourself. Okay. And we, then we consider the four cases. Okay. So the first case is if the cards to the left merge, right? Um, and that only happens if there's at least two cards to the left, because otherwise, what's merging? Right? Um, so in, in that case, as I mentioned before, there's x minus 1 ways to do that. x minus 1 sort of is just, again, four cards to the left, there's three bars in the middle to pair them up with themselves. Um, and out of the n minus 1 cards, uh, n minus 1 ways total to, to pick adjacent pairs. Um, so that's the probability, and then we do that times the answer for x minus 1 y, because remember, we're merging two cards to the left, so the number of cards to the left reduced by 1. Right, um, and so the, okay, then we do the same thing for the right. We do y minus one because the cards, so we merge two cards to the right. Um, okay, then there's the other two cases where we merge with ourselves. And as I mentioned before, there's only there's one over n minus one ways to do that, right? So, um, but in this case, it's interesting because we take the answer for losing a card on the left. Because again, we we merge a card on the left with ourselves, so we lose a card on the left. But then we take that answer and we add one because in the process of doing so, we have added in a contribution. We've merged something with ourselves, so we contributed our score to the, to the final score. So we add 1, and then we multiply that to the probability of happening, which is 1 over n minus 1. Um, and again, this only happens if there's at least one card to the left, because if there's zero cards to the left, then we can't merge with anything. And so we do that with the left, and we do that with the right, and that's the answer. Um, you also want to explain this. Oh, yeah. So this is really cool. Uh, <laughs> this is a nice trick. So no, I, I don't know if you guys seen us do DPs before. Um, but a sort of standard thing we use for DPs is where we memset all the, the default values of the DP 
to negative 1, right? For, for integers. If we're doing integer DP, we set everything to negative 1 um, with the mem set, and then we, ch we use negative 1 as our invalid value. That meaning it's unset. So we usually do say, oh, if DP does not equal negative 1, then we return DP because it's already been set, right? Uh, that doesn't work with floats because you can't mem set a float to negative 1. That just doesn't work. However, what you can do is if you do mem set negative 1, it'll set the floats to NAN, or not a number. Um, and the trick here is that uh, not if you have a value of NAN, NAN doesn't equal itself. It's really weird. So uh, if, you, if you literally check some value x equals NAN, you x equals x, it'll return false, which is crazy, but that's how floats are implemented. Um, so what this checks is whether or not dp is NAN. So if, you, if dp does equal dp, that means dp is not NAN. It's an actual real value, and it'll return the actual answer. Otherwise, we know it's NAN, and we know it's invalid value, which means some, some default value, and it'll actually calculate it using the dp function. Okay. Any questions on this? Why can't you mem set everything to negative one? Because what if I actually want the value negative one? No, 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 that's not why, that's not why. Uh, it's because floats are not implemented as just like bits uh, bits next to each other, right? Floats have like, different, like a full form. But you could still say if dp is equal to minus one. No, you can't, but you can't mem set it was the point. Uh, you can't unlike unlike long, the trick with the with memset right is that memset only sets cars individually, so only sets uh, one byte eight bit values one by one. The cool thing is is that uh, if you have a long or an int, a negative one in an int is just negative one as a car multiplied like duplicated four times, which is really convenient. So if you memset all the cars to negative one, it makes them as ints also negative ones. That doesn't work for floats or doubles because they're not bytes next to each other. Okay. There's a specific yeah, format, which is like exponent, mantissa, sine, right? So if you do negative one there, it just gets all garbled up, and it which is, becomes an end. You can still fill in on uh, on this, right? Yeah, you could, you could. But then you yeah, yeah. you also couldn't use a squiggle then. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is just cleaner. Yeah. But but in particular, what if the value minus one actually appears in my DP that I'm screwed? That's true. That's also true. Wait. I'm kind of confused. Doesn't memset just like set a repeating, like if you set it to negative one, it just sets it to like repeating negative ones, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So then we'll be able to do the same thing with like uh, a float, right? Like memset it to a certain float, it so would just repeat. Memset only amount. works with cars. It works with single bytes, like a, a bit value, that's what I was saying before, uh, which is which coincidentally works for ints and longs, but that coincidence fails for floats. It, when you try, if you set a float to the value f f f f f f f f like the negative one does, it's just some garbage value. You're setting the exponent to FFF and the sign of that is like, it just doesn't work um, and it becomes negative. What I'm saying is like, you can repeat the same, like it's still like two negative, or two like floats of the same uh, representation are still the same number, right? So like, yeah. why can't you just do that? It seems stupid. Okay. But, no, no, mem set itself specifically doesn't work. Like like the value zero X FFFFF like 64 times interpreted as a double is a garbage value. Wait, is it? That, isn't that fine actually? You use the gar you use the garbage value, uh, garbage value then as like your crap. That you value value on that? That? Values when you compare two values it doesn't compare like the bits it's specifically right. If you did totally on that, would that work? Maybe actually, I, I that's actually a really good point. I I don't know how to no I don't think you can do TLD on doubles, but maybe you can. I'm not sure. Maybe let's test it. Let's test it later. Interesting. Yeah. It's okay. Point. Well, anyway, that that aside, that's not the point of this lecture. But <laughs> also, is it just easier to um? Do DP problems like recursively and like you didn't hear? Usually, yes. Yeah. Okay. You mean as opposed to like a for loop, right? Yeah, that's how I usually do it, but it usually ends up pretty messy. So uh, it's kind of sometimes harder to think about the order. Um, so yeah, I, I almost always do it recursively. Okay. Anything I mean, else? Sometimes the for loop can be simpler. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's definitely uh, like I a guess, personal preference thing. The answer just depends. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Okay. All right. Oh boy, my favorite Markov chains. All right. So uh, a Markov chain is basically um, a configuration of n states, um, where if you're on a particular state, um, you basically have a probability. So you're, you're taking a, a distribution over all your states, and you have a probability of going to any particular state on the next step. Right. So uh, for example, in, in this thing here, actually, no, we'll do that. Do that next slide. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So for example, uh, if I'm on state one uh, here, I have a probability one of going to state two. So I would 
always in one step going to state two. If I was on uh, state four, for example, I'd have probability of one fourth of going here, probably one fourth of going here, probably one half of going here. If I was on state five, I'd probably want of going back to myself, so I'd always be stuck here like, forever. All right, so this definition seems uh, simple enough, right? Oh, and yes, uh, some probabilities out of every state must be one. Right? So you must do something. Okay. All right. So uh, the way you can represent Mark Markov chains is uh, with uh, this matrix kind of thing. So basically, um, Mij is a probability of moving from state i to state j. So probability of moving from state one to state two is one. So you can see that here. One to two is one. Um, Sum across each row is basically the sum like of probabilities for one to any other state. So of course that must be one. And so now uh, what we can do is um, if we wanted to see what happens across two steps. Um, so if we were moving from i to j in two steps, then we could move from i to k to j for any k. So what's nice about this is that you would take the sum of i to k times uh, k to j. Uh, you take the sum across all k of those probabilities, and that actually turns out to just be a matrix multiplication. So you could do this, you square this matrix, and you get the probabilities of moving from some state i to some state j two steps. And in general, if you take the nth power, you get transition probabilities after n steps. Um, and so I, just for some context, uh, so in general, Markov chains uh, represent some probabilistic process. Um, so this could be literally anything. Like I could uh be moving over like uh like graph colorings or uh, i don't know uh i could be modeling some game some probabilistic game or something like that so uh these represent uh what is the probability of uh moving from this state configure this state or this configuration or whatever to another state or configuration or whatever. Right. any questions on like what like precisely is a markov chain or anything i know this is kind of like a very vague presentation So uh, here's a problem from a previous GNYR from uh, two years ago. So this is a probabilistic game. So you have uh, 15 players um, that are sitting in a circle, right? So you have them uh, listed as numbers from zero to n minus one. So this player will start with the spinner. So you you spin the spinner, and what happens is with probability uh, it, it gives you it gives you some uh, uh, random values. Uh, so it says with probability l that you should pass the spinner to your left. Uh, with probability r, you should pass the spinner to the right. And with probability 1 minus l minus r, you win the game immediately. Uh, so you can't see it. Actually, can you guys see the text at the bottom here? No. no. Okay. If so, you like move your cursor up for like a second, it should go away. Oh, there we go. I mean, uh, so what is the probability that uh, uh, each player uh, could win the game? So. Um, so using what you know, what very little you know about Markov chains, uh, first of all, how could you model this game? And then two, how could you actually get the answer, which is the probabilities for each player winning the game? So you can see that, uh, for example, uh, so if L is equal to 0.5, R is equal to 0.1, and the, the winning probability is equal to 10%, uh, the first player has the best chance of winning the game. And then uh, these guy, this guy to the left has a slightly higher chance because he has a slightly higher chance of immediately getting a spinner and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, the game could also take a thousand steps or twenty thousand steps before anybody wins with very low probability. So the first question is, like, if I were to make a Markov chain for this, uh, what would be my state?
Uh, EM13 says, does plugging it in right away work like adjacent get the respective probabilities and then itself get one minus L minus R? Um, like the issue with that is like if you if someone wins, then like there'd still be a chance of them going to someone else. So you can store like a separate state for when they've won. Yeah. And with like a one percent or like a one probability that it goes back to themselves. Yes. So yeah. So the point is that I have uh, two n states. So n of them are playing states, and n of them are, are actually. So this, yeah. So uh, I have uh, two times n states. So I can move left, I can move right, or I can win. And once I've won, like Ryan said, you should go back to yourself with probability one. Right. So all these are winning states on the outside, and these are playing states on the inside. Right. So does this uh, state diagram make sense? Ooh, fancy says a key. Okay. So this this represents now uh, my Markov chain, but I haven't written any probabilities here. But um, so I know that, for example, this should be a one. But can someone like tell me real quick like, what should be the probabilities? I mean, it's pretty clear. But L R and one like L to the left, R yes. to the right, and then one minus L minus R down. Yeah, exactly. So I mean that is just given for the problem statement basically. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So now we have to set up the matrix. So uh, okay. <laughs> um, I haven't seen this slide before, but yeah. So uh, okay. So let's let's start with uh, uh, this 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 part here. So uh, we're if we're at a playing state, uh, we want to figure out what is the probability of going to a different playing state. Uh, so, for example, I know that uh, I know a lot of these values should be zero, right? Because, for example, I couldn't go from playing state one and in the next step I am on playing state seven or something, right? And in fact, the only two playing states I could go to are uh, mod n plus one and mod n minus one, right? So, the way that works is that uh, if I'm on playing state zero, then I have probability zero going back to my own playing state. I have probability r going to playing state uh, plus one mod n. And probability uh, L of moving to uh, the playing state minus one. Okay. So then you see that this kind of shifts over because I'm just doing mod okay. And everything else should be zero. There's no way of getting to the playing state in one step. Okay. So that explains uh, kind of going from playing state to playing state. Then, of course, going from playing state to winning state, right? So if I'm on playing state I, I could only go to winning state I. So then I see the identity matrix would appear here, and then it would multiply by this probability 1 minus L minus R. Because that's the probability of going from playing state to a winning state in general. Okay. Now going from a winning state to a playing state, uh, that's not possible, of course. Um, and then going from win state to win state, um, if I'm on winning state I, then I should go always back to winning state I. So I again see the identity matrix with the ones on that. And then if we should want to check that the rows sum up to uh, 1, we know that uh, this guy will always be L and R. And then you would see a 1 minus L minus R here. So then this row sums to 1. And then again, these rows are summing to 1 because this is identity. Is it? OK, so now we have the matrix. Uh, but then the question is, how do we actually use this matrix to get the answer? So again, the, uh, the question we're actually asking is, what is the probability that um, each player wins the game? How can I use my matrix to actually get the answer here? Perhaps one thing to keep in mind is that when they ask, these types of problems, when they ask, they'll ask for the answer within some precision epsilon. Uh, they'll say they want the answer within relative or absolute error, 10 to the negative 6, or 10 to the negative 8, or something like that. 
So uh, let's uh, think again for a second about uh, these transitions. Right? So um, if I looked at uh, the just the, the regular matrix, right? Um, what I'm saying is that I see the probability moving from state i to state j. So what I could do is I could take a, a column vector here, and I could put a 1 in the first slot and a 0 everywhere else. And if I multiply this matrix by this column vector, uh, what I get is another column vector, and it represents the distribution of where I can be after uh, one step if I start from uh, position 0, from state 1, rather. Right, now, why is that? Because I'm doing, um, uh, I just just because of the way that matrix multiplication works, right? And you look at the definition of the inline J, right? So uh, if I did if I did matrix multiplication once by the state vector, I would see what is my distribution um, after stepping once from that position. Uh, now, what if I did uh, with n squared, right? So I take um, again a one here and a zero everywhere else. And then if I were to multiply and get another thing, I would get the distribution after taking two steps. You could just keep squaring it. Exactly, exactly, yes. Uh, so it's, you actually solve two things at one go. And then what I would do is I would look at the resulting uh, win distribution. So the point is, um, oops. <laughs> So yeah, so if I take uh, this matrix to a very high power by squaring it a lot of times, we get transition probabilities after uh, a lot, a lot of steps. Um, and the probability that the game hasn't ended after this many steps is very, very, very small. So that means the game is definitely over. Um, and then uh, what I do is, uh, yeah, so I can, I can just look at the matrix itself and get the transition probabilities, or I can do the multiplication, actually. And what happens is that when I see the resulting distribution, I noticed that uh, the first n value should be almost completely zero because they are uh, the probability of being inside a playing state. So of course, being in a playing state, this shouldn't really be happening after this many turns. And then everything else should be in a win state. And that resulting win state distribution is exactly what I want. So that's all I Note that you don't actually get a physical column vector and multiply it. When you multiply the given the column vector Adam was talking about with 1, 2, 0, that just ends up being the first row. Which makes sense because you're talking about what's the probability of jumping from playing at position 1 to any of these possible options of winning at blah, 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 blah positions. Yeah. After um, 2,000 steps. Alright, well, uh, thanks for coming. Um... So we have listed the problems here if you want to check them out and try submitting to them. And yeah, the slides are, of course, online.